Whoa, 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 no, 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 oof. That's literally almost the worst aerial refueling disaster of all time. Wow. What's up everybody, Ryan here. Welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna talk about what it feels like to aerial refuel in a fighter jet or any other aircraft that's gonna be refueling behind a KC-135, a KC-46, the tankers that are passing gas up in the sky Literally, you got Texaco up there in the sky, passing thousands of pounds of gas. I'm gonna give you some real world stories of what I noticed from doing aerial refueling in thunderstorms, or at least near thunderstorms, and maybe some times where I created my own thunderstorm uh, with piloting skills. And we're gonna, at the end, watch one of the probably most close to a disaster during aerial refueling of all time. I mean, literally this jet, you guys are gonna, you guys are gonna be at the edge of your seat. You're gonna feel chills up your spine uh, because an AWACS is going to basically show us what not to do. So I'm glad you're here. Before we get going, please check out Patreon. It's Max Afterburner over there. MaxAfterburner.co if you want to grab some threads. Let's dive in. Aerial refueling (AR), also called IFR, in-flight refueling, is essentially the biggest thing that multiplies the ability of the U.S. Air Force, of NATO, of other nations to be able to project force. So, in all the studying I did throughout my time as a combat fighter pilot, pretty much every mission that I created was based on the ability for your fighter jet to take on fuel from another aircraft. And I'll tell you a story right now. So I was flying in combat and what ended up happening was a thunderstorm rolled over the base of intended landing. And this is a base where there's literally nothing around for a thousand miles. Like you have one option, there's one runway, which is not a typical situation. You would only do something like this in combat or in situations where you're transporting jets. It's not a situation that you would set up because it just doesn't make sense not to have an alternate. But at this point, it was my only option. That thunderstorm rolled over, no big deal. One thunderstorm, we got two hours of gas on board. And then as you could probably guess, two hours later, what happened? Another thunderstorm rolled over. This one had snow and it was dumping snow onto this runway. Ultimately, the runway was not usable. And this continued, guys, for about six hours. So to meet what was supposed to be a four-hour mission turned into a little more than a 10-hour mission. Yeah, uh, kind of wishing I would have brought a little more food on that one. At the end of the day, it was just a crazy experience, just kind of knowing, you know, when I'm up there in that fighter jet, I plan for the worst and I hope for the best. So when I saw the first thunderstorm roll in, I'm like, yeah, I don't think this is gonna be the only one. And then I start to see the subsequent times the storms would roll in. And to me, I just tried to go to my happy place of Zen. But what gave me that happy place of Zen was knowing that I was gonna have gas stations coming to me. Literally, a KC-135 has more gas in it than a massive truck stop gas station. And you don't have to wait in line for the pump. Typically, there's gonna be jets that roll straight up to the boom. And the way that it works is you set up a cap, a refueling point where you'll meet to then do what's called an aerial refueling rendezvous. At that point, you've done a lot of the hard stuff because when it comes to rejoining with a tanker, it comes down to being able to meet, you know, it's like two bullets hitting each other, meeting in the middle of the sky and plotting an exact course to intercept that tanker. There's a lot of different things you do with your radar. It's literally a science to arrive behind the tanker at 500 feet with closure because you don't want to bleed off all your energy in game and arrive behind that tanker completely out of energy and unable to get gas or having to use more gas, let's say you arrive with a deficit, you've got less than 50 miles an hour, so you're, that tanker is pulling away from you by 50 miles an hour, and you're in a heavy F-15E with bombs, with bags, bags are what you call the tanks that carry the gas underneath that jet, you arrive back there and you've got to tap it into max afterburner, or min afterburner even, and you're on fumes, now you're just looking at yourself and you're like, really? Really? Come on, you're better than that. So what we ended up doing that night was getting multiple tankers to come up and meet us. And to keep us airborne for 10 hours, we refueled five different times to keep our tanks topped off. Now during that time, we were also the airborne alert. So we were the jet that was ready to respond to any situation because some of the jets that were down on alert sitting on the base couldn't take off because the weather was so bad. So it actually served two purposes, right? We're up there waiting, trying to land, and then eventually we realized, um, 
We're not going to try to land anymore because no one else can take off. So we are going to be those eyes in the sky. We are going to be the ones that the coach calls upon when the game is on the line. And that aerial refueling tanker allowed us to do that. Now, what we ended up doing is arriving at the tanker, getting our gas. And that first time getting gas, it was just a reassuring feeling of just knowing that that tanker had your back. And what typically tankers will do is they'll stay with you for a set period of time. So the first tanker stayed with us for roughly three hours as they're up there executing their mission. And then another tanker launched and took their place. And at that point, you just know that you're you're kind of in this warm, fuzzy feeling of, I know I'm gonna have plenty of gas to run these massive jet engines underneath me. And it was just a good feeling to be able to get that last refueling and know we were gonna make it to the point where the weather was gonna break. And the weather ended up breaking after about 10 hours. And then the runway was plowed and we landed with lots of ice, but enough traction for us to get the jet stopped. And after 10 hours, I literally felt like they needed to pick up that jet and pour me out of the cockpit. Imagine just like sitting in a car for 10 hours on a road trip and not ever standing up or ever moving. Yeah, that's not gonna be a good feeling. <laughs> so needless to say, at the end of that, I wanted to pop a bottle of champagne and be like, we did it. You know, longest combat mission for that year from what I had heard. Just an incredible thing though, to see how the aerial refueling, the in-flight refueling allowed us to do that. Now let's talk about the two different types of aerial refueling. So the first type of aerial refueling is called the probe and drogue, and that is basically a basket. The Navy likes to use the basket uh, probably just because they want to be different and they're, you know, they're like, what, we're the Navy. We've got bell bottoms. Of course, we're going to have a basket for aerial refueling. But at the end of the day, when I see that basket flopping around out there, like it does on a lot of the videos, it makes me think that that is probably a little more challenging because at the end of the day, when it comes to aerial refueling, it's about fighting the turbulence and not letting the turbulence throw you off your game. So, and then when that basket is out there flopping around, moving up and down, it's gonna be really hard to aerial refuel in turbulence. And for whatever the reason, the aerial refueling gods, no matter what the case is, it could be a beautiful blue sky day. Typically, once you start refueling, you get choppy air, you get turbulence, thunderstorms roll in, there's crazy winds, there's wind shear, and it's just like the aviation gods are testing you. So for me, that probe and drogue, the basket, it just doesn't seem to make as much sense, but a lot of the jets in the Navy are outfitted to receive the probe and drogue. And the hardest part of the probe and drogue is needing to tap into that thing at the exact right speed to not compress the tube and create basically a big whip like you would see in a CrossFit gym, just sitting there whipping those ropes. If you come in too hot and compress that, you're gonna get that whip of the ropes. And then most likely that probe and drogue is gonna rip off of the jet that is sending the gas to you. And all your wingmen, all your flight mates are gonna be a little bit angry about that. <laughs> The Air Force chooses to use option two, which is the flying boom. And this is exclusively what I aerial refueled off of. Big picture is it's like a little mini airplane with a little set of wings that is flown into your jet by a boom operator. Now it takes two. So you have to put your jet in the perfect position using lights underneath the aircraft. You fly it into the zone where that flying boom can reach you safely and have a little bit of slop. So it has a little bit of play. And some of the communications you would hear would be back one, forward one, down one, up one, and then it starts to get more intense. You can hear the just excitement in the boom operator's voice if you get a little bit too far outside the envelope and it'd be more like up five, down five, left, left four, right four, and that's what you'll probably hear uh, if you're in a situation like a thunderstorm where there's a ton of rough air and you're just fighting for dear life to get gas into your jet. For me personally, I think the probe is harder. The probe and drogue, the basket is way harder than the flying boom. And it's nice to have an operator on the other end who's kind of doing 50% of the work and you're working together as a team to get your jet refueled. All right, my friends, now we're gonna watch this AWACS refuel you made at the end of the video. Let's watch this AWACS refuel and then I'll give you my thoughts at the end. It's gonna be, it's gonna be a wild ride. Anybody else feel like this is two whales out in the ocean, just kind of hanging out? We got two whales up in the sky, just like they would be in the ocean. This just doesn't look natural. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, you can see that aggressive maneuver that the AWACS just made. Basically, they're looking up and they overcorrected. They pulled up into the boom and the boom operator is like, oh sweet, it's in the perfect position. So they immediately go in to the port. That's the problem because at this point, the pilot's now gonna overcorrect again because they're gonna see cues from the lights. As soon as that thing plugs in, that's gonna say down, go down fast. And so they're gonna see those and most likely they're gonna push down here pretty fast and it's gonna get in what's called a PIO, a pilot induced oscillation. Let's see how it goes. Oh boy, this is brutal. This is a really, <laughs> this is this could have been one of the worst accidents ever. The front of that AWACS could literally rip off the back of that KC-135 tanker. Now you can see the PIO happen, just the up, down, up, down, and that is kind of like, it's hard to counteract that, but you literally have to go to your place of zen and not do this. Whew. All right, let's see how it goes. Ooh. Oh, okay, so that was super close. I can tell that they're gonna immediately arrest that climb and just push forward extremely fast. So you can bet that there's a little bit of negative G being pulled in that AWACS. Wow, that is a just crazy rough situation. Okay guys, so there is the flying boom and that was uh, that was rough. That was a close call. Probably the closest call I've ever seen before. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a little bit of the basket and see how that works. Just a little bit complicated, right? You got that big arm coming up and then you got the basket out in front of you flopping around in the breeze. Yeah, not my cup of tea. You can see that basket getting dangerously close to certain sensitive parts of the aircraft, like the pitot tube out front. So again, it's just kind of like, not a smart idea. Whew. Okay, so you can see this thing, this guppy aircraft, basically the version of the F-35 that didn't win is compressing that hose. And now there's a little bit of whip happening in that and it's probably not seated correctly. Okay, so it's gonna rip off a part of that drogue and the connection between it is just not correct. So you're gonna see fuel just dumping out of that thing right now. So again, a lot of moving parts. For me personally, I'll take the flying boom any day of the week. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Ryan here. Don't forget to subscribe to the Max Afterburner channel and check out another video. It would really mean a lot. Thanks so much for supporting this channel. We'll see you on one of these videos over here.